thank you, Doug, for your presentation. And uh, uh, before I go into discussion uh, what this uh, means for Ukraine and how important this case was, I'd like to start also a bit earlier than 2014 and go back to the time of 2008 and 2009 when the contracts which were a subject of the arbitration were initially signed between Gazprom and Naftogaz. Um, I was in Naftogaz since 2002 and by 2008 uh, my position was advisor to the CEO and one of my duties was to go with him to Moscow and to also discuss these matters. Um, all through 2008, uh, Naftogaz and Gazprom were discussing various options of how gas pricing in 2009 for both inputting gas and transiting gas can be settled. Naftogaz uh, was willing to follow European principles. Uh, Gazprom, uh, at some point of time, was on one hand offering to stay with the old contract uh, approach by setting just the price in a political way. Uh, and then all of a sudden, in the middle of the crisis, which occurred in 2009, in January, maybe you remember, when there was a full interruption of gas supply, not only to Ukraine, but also to European countries, and such countries as Slovakia and Bulgaria were on the verge of actually uh, heavy uh, negative consequences, which could result from simple lack of gas in the pipeline system, uh, were in big trouble. Uh, in Moscow, at that point of time, NAFTA gas team was trying to find a uh, consensus with uh, gas representatives uh, in order to sign something which we believed, and as Gazprom suggested, would be based on standard European approach and on standard European uh, contract principles. I would be not exactly honest saying that we had much choice there. We had to sign the contracts. The pressure was huge. So I believe one of the achievements of Naftagas team of that time was the fact that understanding we could not, in such a short period of time, fix all the little things and all specific elements of the contracts to the level it should be done, because simply uh, we were not aware of all elements which should be in place in European contracts at that point of time. Uh, however, we decided to stick one major rule, and that major rule was to use European contract framework and to stay with European law. Uh, and by the way, one of the persons present in this room as the deputy chairman of CEO of Naftogaz at that time, Mr. Dedenka, suggested that uh, we should stick to Swedish law. And that, I must say, was one of very important and very successful decisions made by our team back in 2009, which was later a ground for all these arbitrations we are discussing now, for engaging proper legal team for being able to uh, try this matter not in Moscow court, as Gazprom was suggesting, or in Belarusian court, as the second option was, but rather to go to Swedish court and to have a fair and honor review of the case. Uh, however, in 2010, Ukraine changed dramatically. Mr. Yanukovych, former president, who later appeared to be a corrupt uh, person, uh, however, it was obvious to many people before he became president that nothing good would happen under his rule with Ukraine, uh, came to power. Um, most of the gas team left. I personally left myself um, deliberately uh, signing all the papers uh, because I decided that staying with the company uh, in that time would be too dangerous and would require simply turning into a corrupt person. Uh, and I'm still s I still believe that decision was the right one. Uh, what I observed from outside of Naftogaz is that uh, after 2010, both Naftogaz management and political elite of Ukraine decided not to use instruments which were embedded in the contract and decided to rather stay to political negotiations than going into regular commercial mode with Gazprom and asking them to apply those basic principles which were embedded in 2009. An outcome of uh, that decision, as we calculated, uh, was very dramatic and very negative for Ukraine. Our calculation shows that the total price that Ukraine had to overpay for decision not to use commercial approach, but rather to stick with political approach, is close to 30 billion US dollars since January 2009. 
For our country, that's a very big amount. It would be big for any country, but for Ukraine, which was always struggling to get any cash and was always relying on the help from IMF and international community, that is a huge sum of money. And what we have done through arbitration, and that is one of the big, biggest achievements, I believe, we also managed to recover at least part of it, which now will serve for the benefit of Ukrainian people and will help us in a very turbulent and difficult time of military conflict with Russian Federation. No matter how other people call it, but the way we see it in Ukraine, it's a conflict between Russia and Ukraine, unfortunately. Another important uh, aspect uh, of the outcome, uh, except for things which were mentioned by Doug, that we managed to uh, adjust the price, we managed to make Gazprom pay for contracted volumes. We still hope that uh, within the new arbitration, uh, new tariffs uh, should be implemented in our relations between Russian monopoly and NAFTA gas. Uh, but what is also important, and from my point of view as Ukrainian citizen, is that uh, this whole story help us explain a bit to the West, which we believe is often missed by many European partners when they look at what is happening in our part of the world. Uh, I often hear from people from France, from Germany, from Italy, who would say, like, look, Andre, why can't you just sit with Gazprom and uh, decide what is the right thing to do? Why are you always in conflict? Why do you need intermediaries? Why you go to arbitrations? We, from France, we just sit and we find very commercial and viable solutions. Uh, that seems strange from their point of view. What also may seem strange from point of view of uh, us now is how Gazprom behaves after decision was made. Uh, specifically, why decision was not honored. It's so damaging for their reputation. Uh, if you look at potential consequences, arresting or as our legal team is saying, attaching Gazprom assets uh, within this process of enforcement is very damaging to any company. And Gazprom, which owns hundreds of billions of assets in Europe, simply is not acting rationally uh, given all the circumstances and given the fact that decision is effective, even if they'll challenge it, it will take quite a long period of time, and the likelihood of their success, as was mentioned again, is lower than 6%, which doesn't make any sense. But that makes a lot of sense for us, because our view is that Gazprom is driven in if you look at Ukrainian relationships, if you look at other countries, and Russia also as a country, is driven by a different ide ideology. Uh, all territories which used to be the part of big Russian empire, from their perspective, should not be governed by regular principles of any law, of any approach of fairness, or any arm's length basis transactions. They believe that this territory is something which should be only governed by their position, and they honestly don't feel that it's fair from anyone from outside to ask Gazprom act uh, in a regular manner with Ukraine, with Poland, uh, with Belarus, with Georgia, wherever you pick it. Uh, the outcome of this approach results exactly in a very different uh, view from Russian side. It results in actions which cannot be explained by regular commercial logic. And this is where we were hugely surprised by something which was also mentioned today, is the outcome of antitrust case against Gazprom. Uh, what, from our point of view, was hugely missed uh, by European Commission when they were observing is that by trying to act under regular commercial norms and uh, traditions in Western Europe, in Central and Eastern Europe, Gazprom is acting totally different. And until that behavior is, br is brought in compliance with European regulation, uh, there will be no real competition, there will be no rule of contract law or any other law, and the fact that Gazprom can s keep abusing their position without any downside actually promotes them to do so in the future. That is why I believe the case we had should have much wider implications than simply implications for Ukraine. It should be seen as something where Gazprom, 
was made to follow regular European rules. And the more Gazprom does so, the better the market will become, the easier it will become for all gas companies, and the more trust gas as business will bring back to its clients. Thank you for your time. Just before you leave, does anybody have any questions oh. at this stage? <laughs> I'm just wondering, uh, you know, whenever you go through a very complicated um, and contentious conflict in this way, as you have done, how you feel about the relationship going forward? Difficult. That's a long answer, but so we don't really a have difficult, that. Difficult one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, again... Uh, I think we'll probably find out more about that uh, in the course what of What we've been always, um, I would say, what was always our position for the last four years is that we as Nafta Gas are welcoming Gazprom to negotiate with us in due manner. And if there is willingness to switch to regular commercial relationships without having Mr. Putin in the room, without maybe having other people in the room, but signing contracts which are compliant with regular practice, they are more than welcome. We as Nafta Gas will be always willing to find compromise on price and conditions on other matters. However, that should be based on the principles of fairness. Mr. Kobliov. Oh, yes, just quickly, yes, please. Um, Would you like to say your name, where you're from? Yes, Rob Dempsey with uh, Gazprom, sorry, Council of Labour. I am the former CEO of the Czech Trans Gas and was responsible for two arbitrations with Gazprom. Republic and how did that pan out? By the way, <laughs> represented by Mr. Frank uh, yeah. successfully. Uh, <laughs> the first one, and, uh, the first one was a gas from Sudan, you know, on paper pages. It's very similar to our case, by yeah. the way. Very similar. Very similar. Case, and I say, you know, to what Bach remarked, you know, they're acting in the Swedish ordinary courts against better knowledge because they tried to, tried the same thing with that award in Vienna, and of course miserably passed. On the second one, it was the price review. There they behave differently to what you've experienced. They just paid $1.5 billion in back wages. And I can say that because that's public domain. Maybe one quick remark, since I had this experience in the Czech Republic, also a former common com country, I agree with you that sometimes you have to really pull the gun and go to arbitration and go all the way. We have done that as well. Uh, but at the same time, with the settlement here, I will also say, there's a difference in the political will to introduce traded, uh, uh, traded uh, European markets and so on. If you compare your country, Ukraine, with Poland, you went all the way. You're farther east than Poland. You went all the way and bought that European traded crisis and were able to demonstrate in arbit arbitration that that's still a cheaper price, you know, and Poland does not. So there's also a point of political will of the respective governments of the former communist countries to go that way, and if they don't do that, then we, they will fail. We have not, but others might. Uh, and um, s reflecting on, the last, on these four years again, uh, I would say that uh, the easy part of our decision-making process back in 2014 is that we didn't have much choice. Hmm. We, were, we were in positions that it's, it was basically black or white. And I am very glad that we chose the way to, as you said, to pull the gun. And I am very glad that we managed to diversify. And uh, I am very glad that we found the right partners uh, to go along with us on this route. I w wanted to make a small remark. Uh, the first speaker mentioned that Vic Borain was representing many companies who were selling gas. So they were sellers, not buyers. And uh, uh, when we chose Vigo Ryan, and that was, uh, I would say, a choice based on their previous experience and uh, their credentials with other companies. Uh, I love the story which Yuri told me, uh, my colleague, when they came w to sign a contract in Norway with one really big, well-known Norwegian company. I can't name them exactly here. And uh, they said, OK, we can meet anywhere. And our team said, why don't we meet in the office of our lawyers? They said, oh, fine, sure, we'll come. And they said, OK, our lawyers have Vigo Ryan. And they called in five minutes and said, actually, no, we are not coming there. Can you change like office to any other place? We would be happy to meet anywhere you say, not in their office. And then we thought, hmm, we've chosen a good company. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Oh, sorry. Yes, big fun. Speaking of goodies, uh, 
That's by the way, Yuri Vitrenko, our chief, yeah, how, how chief commercial yeah. officer. Yes. Um, Do you want to just quickly introduce yourself? Uh, Yuri Vitrenko, <laughs> Naftogaz of Ukraine, chief commercial officer. Uh, Borgman basically uh, mentioned uh, or compared Ukraine uh, to Poland. Uh, and then uh, if we look at Naftogaz, again, four years ago, Naftogaz uh, was considered to be a so-called black hole of uh, Ukrainian economy. Again, like an, uh, an example of Ukrainian corruption. It was not just about Yanukovych. Uh, Naftogaz sometimes would have been more famous for corruption everywhere in the world. Um, also, again, Naftogaz was a dominant player in the Ukrainian market, and there were complaints about third-party access to Naftogaz infrastructure, again, abuse of dominance in the Ukrainian market, and stuff like that. Uh, Volgan mentioned that there were some amazing reforms in Ukraine, so probably you can share um, your thoughts about the role of Naftogaz in these reforms. And uh, if Naftogaz uh, started from uh, itself, uh, in terms of, for example, application of uh, proper European, Western, civilized uh, rules, basically, becoming fair, again, to customers, to employees, to the government, and, uh, and stuff like that. Thank you. Um, so Naftogaz, in the context of reform, you have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> One of, the, one of the arguments often used by Russian side, which by the way is very powerful, is that yes, we you may not like what we are doing, but if you look at nafta, gas, and Ukraine, they're even worse than us. So before going to arbitration, one of the difficult choices we had to make, uh, except for easy choice, is to also start changing ourselves. And by applying European principles within Ukraine, by allowing third party access, and just to give you perspective, when we came to company in 2014, except for Nafta Gas, there was only one company which was allowed to import gas from European Union in very small volumes. Now we have tens of them. We have big names importing gas into Ukraine, trading gas. We are welcoming them. So we started with implementing real and effective third-party access uh, in Ukrainian gas market. What we also did is we implemented no tolerance to corruption rule in Nafta Gas. Uh, one of the first moves uh, in my career was to fire all except for one members of previous board of the company. Uh, and that was done for a simple reason, that having stayed with company for two years, for four years, you know, coach time, none of them could not be touching corruption. Uh, well, mean, I mean that no, none of them could avoid uh, to touch corruption. And uh, also transparency. Uh, new level of transparency, starting with usual things as uh, audits, starting and finishing with such an unusual thing as it was in the of Ukraine two years ago, uh, our team uh, decided to follow the requirement and to publish all import contracts, all historic prices of uh, gas we were purchasing from European Union to avoid speculation that nafta gas continues to be as corrupt as it had been before. All of that combined increased our chances for success. And all of that combined, by the way, is difficult for me to judge exactly, but I believe that when looking at positions of both parties in the tribunal, I think the fact that nafta gas managed to transform and to change and become much closer to Western standards of corporate governance was also a factor which was taken into account by tribunal. Thank you. Thank you very much.